Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Let's Boogie One on One show. My name is Let's Boogie Jones, and tonight the topic is racism in America, state of emergency. As we all know, we're dealing with the COVID 19 pandemic that has isolated the world. And now we're reminded once again, over and over again, of the racism that exists here in this country. Tonight, we have put a panel together of some strong, strong brothers. And it's our time to deal with the state of emergency. As we've all witnessed the execution of one of our very own 46 year old African American man by the name of George Floyd. It took a video to bring the world together, but unfortunately, it took the sacrifice and the loss of life of George Ford to make people finally say, I've had enough. We go way back to Emmett Till. We had enough then. Michael Stewart, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, so many others, so many others, and this continues to happen over and over again. And if we don't do something now, it will just be business as usual. So tonight on the show, I've invited a special panel of hand-selected individuals that are going to shed some light on not only the narrative, but we're looking for a course of action. It is time, it is time, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, for us to stand up together, united in solidarity, to make a change to a system that is broken, that has been broken. No more talk, no more talk, no more protesting for two weeks and then we go home until it happens again. And let me remind you to vote, to vote, to vote, no justice, no peace. On the show tonight, I've invited sports journalist, best-selling author, host of one of the New York Knicks' programs, post and pre game shows. His name is Mr. Chris Martin. I've invited Dr. Mark Williams, who is a doctor of education. He does sports management, and he's a well-known figure in the sports industry. I've also invited Mr. Olden Polonese, former NBA and retired NBA player for the Seattle Supersonics, the Kings, very intricate gentleman who will surprise you with the depth of his knowledge. I've invited Mr. Charles Boyd from Los Angeles, California, who's a managing partner of the CAB Housing Development and Community Firm. I've also invited my professor, that's what I call him, the professor. His name is Mr. Clifford Benton. Long Island University professor will be on the panel tonight as well. Ladies and gentlemen, to round it out, I've invited the doctor himself, Mr. Matthew Knowles. That's right. He'll be with us on the show tonight. And we're going to start with Mr. Chris Barton. You are now a part of the Let's Boogie One on One show. And this is a state of emergency. No justice. No peace. I can't breathe. 
God bless you. Rest in peace, George Floyd and all of the others. We will not let your life go in vain. Stand up, stand up, stand up. We are in a state of emergency. Let's proceed with the show. Thank you. When I look at the numbers, when I look at the numbers, and I read and I write these stories and talk to these people who have been stricken, it is it's profound and it's, it's disturbing when you look at the disparity and, and how we are impacted by this. And so I'm working on a story right now about the value of us participating in a clinical trial. We obviously have a real. Can issue. you hear me? Yeah, we have you. We have you. Incredible, but yeah, not have. incredible. Okay, hold on, Mr. Bond is speaking. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, uh, I was saying I'm, I'm working on a study, a story about the, the value of black people participating in clinical trials because re the reality is sometimes a vaccine won't work on us if they if we don't have our genes to be tested as a part of the, the trials, the studies. And so we have a real history of, of a, a deep history of distrust as it, as it, as it relates to medical uh, experiments based on the Tuskegee syphilis test um, experiment for 40 years where they were giving black men syphilis when telling them they were giving them free health care. That alone has permeated the community and made us feel very hesitant to participate. But it, in the end, as part of this, as part of uh, combating this virus, we're going to have to participate in these clinical trials. And it's, it's going to be a real challenge to get us to get beyond this lack of trust that we have. So it, it's a difficult thing to look at the numbers when we make up 13% of the population with 50% of the cases. Wow. Uh, that says something that's really wrong, um, not only because we we have these, um, these numbers, but because we have these health disparities, which are all based on the, the lack of fairness in the country, the disparity in healthcare, the disparity in how you're treated at hospitals. All of that contributes to uh, to our health issues that contribute to these numbers that are so alarming with coronavirus. Okay, thank you. Mr. Polonese, would you like to speak? Yes. Well, yeah, well, it's affected me in multitudes of ways. Uh, one, my brother uh, came down with the coronavirus, and, but he recovered. Oh, great. But we lost a family member, and it wasn't even because of the coronavirus, but it was in part to it because of the fact that they said they weren't dealing with anyone unless it was COVID related. She wow. had surgery and ended up getting an infection, went to the hospital, they sent her home. Two days later, she died. Wow. And so Jeez. to me, that's an issue within itself. Yeah. And so um, I'm from the school of, don't tell me, Oh, we care about everybody, but yeah, we still sell cigarettes. We still sell sugar <laughs> cereals. We still sell everything. Right. So please, I don't want to hear all of that crap. I, I'm at the point now, you know, if you guys are creating this, then you need to acknowledge it and take responsibility. So okay. I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be one of those argumentative type of people because I'm not. I just like to try to deal within the facts of everything. So I'm not really all scared and petrified of this coronavirus because it's been around for a while so right. i pray that people are healthy but at the same time i'm not freaking out over this okay appreciate that dr Knowles. yes sir first of all again just to see seven black men gathered together uh that's a it's a great feeling and i and i thank you thank you so, uh, gosh, in a, in a number of ways. You know, I'm, I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, I have hypertension, so I fall in that 
and I'm 68 years old, so don't you forget it. That means I'm, <laughs> older, I'm older than all of you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, it put me at a higher risk. I just have to be more diligent, uh, careful, um, make sure that I uh, I stayed at home, quite frankly. I uh, always stayed at home uh, in the last several years. So this was not an adjustment. Uh, Adjustment, and I and I say this. Uh, I get to spend every day with my best friend, also name is named my wife. Okay. Uh, so it's you no, know, we make it fun. We we, but I did have a high level of anxiety. I have a black therapist. I uh, I've written a number of books, and I talk about in racism from the eyes of a child. My second book, I, I talk about the racial trauma. Uh, that I went through as a kid. I grew up in Gaston, Alabama. I know none of you have ever been there. <laughs> it's a little small town, a little small town north of Birmingham. Uh, I never went to a black school. I'm 68 years old. Wow. I want you to wrap your head around hmm. George Wallace, Al Lingo, Bull Connor. Hmm. Matthew Knowles, 68 years old, growing up in Gaston, Alabama, going to a white elementary school, going to a white junior high school, going to Gaston High, and going to University of Tennessee, where I played basketball, by the way. Uh, and then I transferred to my first black school, Fisk University. Wow. So, you know, for me, um, you know, personally, I, I, I you know, I, I had some personal losses, but nothing, nothing comes close to the loss of life. Uh, we can replace those material things, right? But when I talked to my therapist and I, and I told him about I was having this anxiety, I like to share with you brothers uh, what he told me. He said that in a crisis, whatever wherever and whatever you are. So if you're in a, a state of fear mm. before this crisis, then it's been magnified 20 times. Yeah. If you were in a state of hatred, then it's been magnified 20 times. If you hated your wife, that's been magnified. <laughs> uh, I like to help jokes, guys. We all have fun. Uh, <laughs> But, but I think that's where, that's what, you know, this was long coming. I've looked racism in the eye. I've been beaten. I've been wow. spit on. I've been electric prodded. Mm. I look racism in the eye. When you see that hatred, that I just want to kill you because you're black. Wow. That's the only reason. I want to kill you. Uh, I've drank at a colored water fountain. I've used the bathroom in a colored bathroom, sat in a colored doctor's office in the, mm -hmm. in the sitting area. Uh, so where we are today, you know, it's a lot of folks that, that help us get here. You know, I love, yeah. I, we need more Malcolm X. Right. We need more Black Panthers. We, we need leaders like Martin Luther King. Uh, and I can only say, I'm a college professor of 12 years. Uh, I love what I see and what I hear these young black people are doing. And it's time for us, and I speak for myself, yes. us older people to step aside and find these young leaders and celebrate them. We don't need to see these same old ass faces. <laughs> we need to see some young youth with energy that can connect. It, it's crazy. You go and watch CNN, and you hear all of these leaders talking about, hey, don't come out, don't do this. I'm like, what damn kid is watching TV? They on social media. Right. Why y'all not going to social media? Right. This is true. Like, these kids ain't watching CNN. And I, I don't get it. It's time for change. It's time that we modify and alter behavior. Whatever we have to damn do, it's time to modify and alter and change. It's not going to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Change is never comfortable. Matter of fact, the only person I know like change are babies. 
They love their diapers. <laughs> <laughs> but Dave is, is supposed to be uncomfortable, and I'm glad yeah. to be here. Thank you so much. Dr. Dr. Mark, are you yes, with sir? us? I'm here. Okay, brother, how you doing? I'm blessed, man. Honored to be here. Thank you, Dr. Benden. And uh, Matthew Knows. Dr. Knows, what's up, man? Hey, brother. Living the dream. Good to see you, man. Living back. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, um, I have um, a lot to think about, man. A lot of process here. Uh, I just got off the show right now where I, um, we talked about how does COVID, um, inter you know, how does it affect you? How has it affected me? So I, I grew up in New Jersey. And my father taught African studies for 39 years. The curriculum for the state of New Jersey for black history. So I grew up in predominantly white affluent suburbs with all sure. white people. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All, you know, few, few, two black families. And so I had the best of both worlds of having, being at a predominantly white school, learning, learning European history all day, but having, having the opportunity to have a father that taught African studies. So I would go home to go to school with white kids all day, come home to black power at night. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So, wow. So okay. it was interesting listening to Bon Jovi, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden in the 80s, and then come home and listen to Luther Vandross, listen to the, to the Four Tops, listen to The Temptations. And then at night, I could sneak in and listen to, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, Ralph McDaniels, DJ Ralph McDaniels, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Video uh, music box, yes, sir. Listen to yeah. Run DC, Curtis blowing the cats. So I had the best of both worlds of really having an understanding about who I was as a black man living in a predominantly white environment and being able to stay focused and stay socially stay conscious. Um, but my mom and dad didn't believe in interracial dating. So I didn't date in high school. I was an athlete, but they were like, you were, you were gonna focus on your academics. We don't want you doing that. So uh, this was in the mid eighties. So, so they wanted me to be around more black people outside of my cousins, right? So they sent me to a historically black college. I, I, went to a I went to Tuskegee first and transferred to play basketball, ran track at A&T. Um, and then my career was in sports and entertainment. So I worked for Champ Sports, Reebok. Um, so I've had a chance to work with pretty much every major sports and entertainment entity, you know, um, mm. and on the planet. Yes. Um, so I've been blessed. Uh, so at the same time, went back and got a doctorate in education so I can bring that energy and education back to schools. Like I'm rocking Florida Memorial, uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Jafis Jarvis, uh, Jafis uh, Hardrick, who is um, the president there. And so um, I'm rocking this today because uh, they, they made an offer to me uh, last week, as well as I uh, got an offer live on the air yesterday with, um, with, uh, with, with a, uh, another university down, down there. And so for me, the pandemic has been interesting. Uh, for years, I've always talked about doing a show and um, it forced me to create my own brand. I wanted to create something. I don't want to go on CNN and Fox or BET. I wanted to be in a, in a space where I created my own thing. I have my own voice, similar to what you're doing, brother, for the mm -hmm. boogie, and, and be able to, to have the content I wanted. And I did that. And I called it Dr. Mark's Masterclass. And gotcha. Dr. Mark was one of my guests. I just interviewed Carl Lewis last week and even talked to Ben Johnson. Uh, so that was interesting. Yeah, um, I know it was. <laughs> yeah, we got to talk about that one. And so for me, what I've been able to do is use the pandemic to be able to talk about things that I normally have not talked about. My career has been talking about music, sports, and entertainment, but then I got a chance to really talk about race, class, and gender now because of what's going on all around the country, all the social unrest. So a lot of my white friends that are new, they're like, oh my goodness, I'm Dr. Mark. Oh my goodness, I didn't know. You have to really walk into a, a convenience store and, and use a, a, a bag when you buy some gum? I'm like, yes. You mean to tell me you don't turn oh your, you know, your windows down when you drive? I said, no. You mean to tell me you bring your ID with you when you go on for walks? Yes. They're like, oh, my God, there's so much to think about. Exactly. And so <laughs> I get a chance to educate uh, people without yelling and getting upset with them, but really trying to educate them and, and using things that they can relate to. So when people say, well, why do they say Black Lives Matter, Dr. Williams? That's just, I don't understand it. That's racist. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm an educator. I said, well, let me, edu let me educate you on something about the word racism. Racism has nothing to do with that. Racism is about control of a people that is in control of this majority. So that is not the correct subject verb agreement to put in that same context in a sentence. Don't use racism in the same context with Black Lives Matter. They have nothing to do with anything. If I say I like old and Polynesian or I like the Bulls and you like the Lakers, oh, you're prejudiced or you're, you're racist. No, I just like the Bulls. Use it, <laughs> use it correctly, right? 
Or if you say, why is Black Lives Matter? I said, well, remember when Michael Vick, you know, um, you didn't like when Michael Vick did the thing with the dogs? You guys, everyone was okay with you saying dogs' lives matter. Everyone, I agree with right. that. It's not well, something. If you care about a dog, why can't you care about a black man being killed? And since I'm 50, so since I've been alive, I don't remember a time or a year that police have not killed black men, period, period. So for me, so true. this has been an interesting uh, pandemic piece. What it's done is it's provided me an opportunity to take all my skill sets and create something. I went out to um, Home Depot. I asked them to build me a desk. I created a studio in my house. And I'm like, this is what I did. And I have nice. my show Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So for me, I don't use it as a, a way to, to cry and complain. I use it as a way to educate and empower and to be able to come and do this show. Dr. Benton asked me to come do this show. I said, I don't care who's on this show. If black men are asking me to come and talk wow. about something important, I'm coming. Period. Okay. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So thank, thank you. you for having me, brother. And, right. I just and by say, the way, I, I didn't see your show. All, yes, and I just want to say I want to thank all of you for answering the calls. There was no jimming and jamming, hibbing and hamming. It was <laughs> what time? Do you need yes, me there? So I want to thank all of you for for coming in. Did we hear from Charles Mo? No, no, Charles. You have the oh, mic. No, not on this issue. You haven't. You have the so mic. Firstly, up. firstly, let me let me just uh, I just want to really share. Uh, let's thank you for your leadership, uh, brother, professor, my brother Cliff. Thank you. You guys convening this really, really important dialogue. And I'll certainly say that I agree and, and echo all the brothers who just shared their sentiments. You know, for me, this issue of COVID, I, I, you know, I'm looking at it within the context of a statement that I believe Malcolm X made many years ago, that when, when the United States of America has a cold, black man has pneumonia. Mm. So from, from a personal perspective, I actually was touched personally. Although back in January, mid-January, early February, I went in and was treated for pneumonia. I look back on that now, looking at the symptoms, it's very probable that I was probably hit with this, this COVID virus uh, and it just hadn't been diagnosed properly. Um, so from a very personal perspective, you know, I feel that you know, the, the deaths that I've seen occur, that I'm sure that we all have seen around, mm -hmm. have really, really have just been uh, incredibly uh, impactful in looking at where we are today, uh, given the, the gravity of, the, of, the, of this pandemic. You know, I think from a, from a professional uh, perspective and as a community developer, you know, I'm clearly looking at the disparities in terms of, again, how our communities are always harder hit. We're always in the position of being marginalized because of our real the frailty of our conditions. So as I'm out working with businesses in the Los Angeles area, you know, the, 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 the fact that the, the lack of access to capital and credit, you know, when, when, when something like this hits us, we're always, again, more greatly impacted. Um, you know, clearly look at the disparities in health across the country. It's really, really now demonstrating and highlighting the fact that, you know, obesity, blood pressure, you know, it goes on and on and on, diabetes. You know, the fact that if we do get hit with something like this virus, this so-called so novel virus, you know, we're again going to be the ones to catch, you know, the, 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 the worst of it. So, you know, looking at all of that, I, there's another aspect, and I think I heard some of the brothers actually articulate this. You know, there's another side to this whole thing as well that we've always overcame. You know, if it wasn't for this temporary sort of, if you would, slowing down, you know, having to draw home, it gave me a chance to be incredibly reflective, you know, and the connection that has occurred with brothers just reaching out. We've been on a number of conference calls over the last few months, and it's really, in, 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 uh, uh, it really created some dynamic, ongoing dialogue that's going to lead to positive action. So I'm very encouraged. I mean, at, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, as grim as everything looks, we've always came and rised above any challenge uh, put, put before us. And I think I'm seeing that happen um, as we address this issue as well, Les. That's great, brother. Thank you, man. Brother Professor, do you have a word? Well, th this is all I, I want to say. I, I just want to pass the, the, the ball. I got five of the baddest brothers on the planet on at the same time. And I want to get every single possible second with them. So I'm just going to throw out the first, the, the, the first question, so to speak. Go and then you come behind me, big brother, and I'll step out the way. But it's the Curtis Brun. Absolutely. Essence, number one best-selling author, 
baddest writer on the planet, Curtis Bunn, this is my question to you. And then I'm going to back off. You wrote an article that was nothing short of amazing, nothing short of fabulous, and you're in a place called Atlanta, and it's kind of hot in Atlanta. Can you tell us what the temperature is in Atlanta as it pertains to what has been going on from, you know, from Breonna Taylor to the brother Ahmed to, George, to, to brother George Floyd? What is the Atlanta vibe? Because we're in different places. Olden Polonies is in one place. Mark is in another. Dr. Knowles in another. Charles Mo in another. So if we could just kind of take the temperature of what it is like where you're at. So Curtis Bunn, take it away and talk to us about ATL. Yeah, the, I, I came in today about, uh, I was out in the streets about six o'clock coming in and I was uh, near, I live in downtown. I live about a mile and a half from where they are gathering and all the, Pro, the protests and the demonstrations take place and some disturbances. And I was, I was moved by, like uh, Mr. No spoke about the, the youth, the, the age group of these guys. The temperature is higher than 94.6 to 96.4, whatever it is to be, to feel normal. It is a high, much higher um, temperature right now in the city. I walked by, I came by through near Georgia Tech and at the light, hundreds of kids, hundreds of kids in a row were coming through, walking with their signs of all races, which I think has been, I think we'll probably get into this a little later, but surprisingly that it's not just us that, that are frustrated. The progressive young white kids, uh, Asian kids and, and others are taking this to heart as well. And they are walk, they're marching from where I saw them was another four miles to get to where the, all of the demonstrations were to take place. So it is heated here. I mean, there was a demonstration three weeks ago. A caravan of us went down to uh, Brunswick, Georgia, where Brother Aubrey had been murdered on the streets there. Uh, it's five hours away from Atlanta. But, you know, we feel it all. We, we, we see ourselves, we see our sons, we see our cousins and nephews and our friends in all of these killings. So it's very personal to us as black men living in a country where this kind of thing is happening way too often. And so, uh, Atlanta is a city that is obviously the heart of the civil rights movement, hasn't had that, that kind of um, struggle in recent years. But what has happened now, and I think the, the, the brutality of it, actually having seen it for yourself, has made everyone aware, has everyone on edge. And, and I, don't think, I don't think that this thing is going to end anytime soon in Atlanta. I think that the, 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 there's a curfew that's 8 o'clock. It's 8.30, they're down there gathering in large numbers. I have CNN on and, uh, right here, and they're gathered in large numbers, ignoring the curfew because they have a, they have a stake in this, and, and it's their lives in the future. And so I don't think in New York it's going to change anywhere. I don't think anywhere. I'm looking at D.C. right now, there's a curfew. Everybody's out feeling like this is something that's going to be sustained, not just for now, but for some, some time to come. Mm. All right, thank you. Brother Polonese, can you tell us what's going on in the area where you're at? We're going to pass the ball to you. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. And oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hectic. And, you know, we have 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. curfews based on the city that you're in. Um, again, you know, they've been destroying, you know, Beverly Hills and all these places. So I was here for the 92 riots, the Rodney King riots. And you know, we were actually in the playoffs during that time, and we had to move our games to Anaheim. And mm. I remember how crazy it was, and we were destroying our property. So this is a little bit different than 92 in the fact that mm. a lot of stuff has happened in the more affluent areas. Yes. And I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying it's different. Right. But at the same time, what I'm upset about is the big elephant in the room is the fact that our movement is getting hijacked. Mm. You know, it's the fact that, you know, we're <laughs> protesting George Floyd, but yet we got hijacked. <laughs> and so to me, that's the problem that I'm having within all of this. You know, people, you know, the bricks being placed in certain in locations right. for people to throw. Right. Oh, come on, man. We're too, <laughs> old. We're too old for this stuff, man. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's frustrating to me. You know, we've watched a bunch of our brothers and sisters die, get murdered. We understand that. And so I'm just going back to what was said earlier. It's like, what's the course of action? I yes. don't want to hear nothing else anymore. 
I don't want to talk My about brother. nothing. I'm done. You know, the only difference between this and Eric Garner is the fact that we actually watched it second by second, minute by minute. That was the only difference. So to me, we've been seeing everybody getting killed. I'm sick and tired of it. I've been in this damn fight for 40 plus years, you know, I, from the hunger strike that I did in 93 to protesting everything. So it's like, I'm personally, I'm just tired of it. You know, bottom line is, this thing's about haves and have nots. They don't mm -hmm. care about us. And so we have to care about ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been deleted from history. We've been, we know all of that. What's our next course of action? Yes. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I agree with you 100%, brother. And I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Dr. Knowles, you said something earlier. You said the older people need to step out the way, find these young leaders, and let them carry the torch. I want to talk a little bit about that because I'm, I'm, in, I'm in lock and step with you, uh, Holden, on that. You know, we've had these conversations. We've had them. What are we going to do about it? What's next? How many times are we going to sit here on now we're on Zoom? Before we was in, the, in, in, in somebody's house. We was at the church. We was at the community center. What are we, when are we going to do something? And I'm not talking about violence or anything. I'm talking about, you know, to change this, to change the system that it works for us in a balanced and even way. You know, that's the question I'm going to throw out. What can we do? What is our course of action after this conversation? Can we weigh in on that? Anybody Les, can jump in. Yes, Les, before we move on to another yeah. question, sure. I think that was very critical in terms of what's happening, you know, the, the different geographies. Okay. And, uh, uh, yes, and Brother Polonese really, and I'm here in Los Angeles as well, so I echo everything he said. I want to share with you, though, the biggest concern that I have. I mean, Los Angeles has never been a stranger to, to, uh, to civil protests, obviously, there's a long legacy, and as the brother pointed out, uh, going back to 1965, of course, during the 92 uh, Rodney King uh, uh, condition. But there's something that's a actually at play now, and again, it was already spoken on here, and that is the, 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 the sense that this movement is being usurped by, by external agitators. That, that's a right. big thing. Now, I want to share just if I can, very quickly, because I'm not speaking from what I heard or what, you know, at some some kind of you know rumor mill. Well, I was actually involved in a situation where after the uh, verdict was uh, was announced during the uh, Ferguson uh, issue with Michael Brown, and the minute we actually were sitting in it with a group of people in a uh, restaurant here in Pasadena, the minute that the verdict was announced, people sort of got up. You know, once the uh, broadcast was over, we all went to our cars ready to head out of the parking lot. I personally witnessed an individual walking, and he walked past my vehicle, but his cadence was very materialistic, if you would. He was walking like he was almost marching. He was carrying a bag. He walked into a large dumpster that was hidden behind two big steel doors mm. uh, and cinder blocks, and there was light on the inside of the dumpster, and I could see him walking back and forth. I sort of assumed maybe this guy was homeless. Maybe he was back there changing clothes. I didn't know what was going on. But as he came out, he's now holding two bags. One bag he was holding away from his body as though maybe it was gasoline, whatever it was. He didn't want it to get on him. He walked about 30 yards, jumped into a brand new parked uh, Jeep Cherokee, no lights. He jumped in the back seat, which meant obviously somebody was in the front driving. They spun a hard U-turn and sped out of the parking garage. Now, not having any context of what was happening, I mean, I didn't really have much to make of that. But now, of course, hearing all the reports from people that I'm working with here in Los Angeles about all kinds of nefarious activities, people in black, almost uniform, you know, setting cars on fire. I mean, clearly we have to recognize that this, this, this movement is being usurped by other forces. We need to be cognizant of that and be aware that this is, this is a part of a larger issue list. Okay, so now, so now remember the question I asked. So let's, let's, let's deal with that right now. What do you guys think about what he just said? What is the purpose of these agitators? What is their goal? Um, because I'm hearing that in New York, I'm watching CNN every day. I've been on this seven days for the last seven days. I haven't watched anything but CNN. Um, what do you guys think? Of course, the goal is destruction. We understand that. But 
how do you think that's going to play out? Is that interrupting what we're doing? Because the narrative a little bit had changed yesterday. It, it became more about looting and, and all this kind of stuff. But today I'm looking at it and it appears to be that it's much more peaceful. So can you weigh in on that? What do you think? And how do you think that's going to turn out? And how is that going to affect the bottom line of action like what we're talking about here, trying to move forward? Well, well, is it going to hinder anything? Well, uh, let Dr. Knowles lead off with that because it was on him and let Dr. Mark kind of follow him, even though we'll hear from everybody on that question. So Dr. Knowles, it's on you. Sure, thank you, Clifford. I, I'm enjoying just listening to you brothers. I just want to tell you, thank you. I'm, I'm really enjoying. Um, so many things are going through my mind. I, I, I was thinking how, you know, the, what's happening today was happening in the 60s when I was demonstrating and marching. Nothing different. Uh, I was thinking Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were, were both 39 years old when they died. Martin Luther King Jr. started at 23 years old. Folks, old people, get out of the way. <laughs> Malcolm X was in his 20s. These, I teach these young minds, these they understand critical thinking. They're not going to do it the way we want them to do it. And I'm just good with it, folks. You know, a bully, we've all heard this. What do you do with a bully? You can either get beat up every damn day, or finally, like my mother told me, you boy, you better knock that boy in the mouth. <laughs> and guess what? When I knocked him in the mouth, he left me alone. Racism is a bully. Yeah. It's a bully. And so when I look at all of this, you know, it's just when I look at structural racism in America, uh, I, I can't talk on the root, the, the violence, or the hell, I threw rocks when I demonstrated. Uh, that's that anger, that hopelessness. It doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it right, but I can have empathy and understand. Uh, but when I look at structural racism in America, you know, it's been a vicious circle. You know, we talked about health and wellness. And, and, and there's no reason, if any of you guys know me, I've been talking about health and wellness. I did 20 years of diagnostic imaging. Music wasn't my thing. I was the first black man to sell MRI and CTs in a America. I was the mm. first black man to be a neurosurgical specialist in America. Hey, I, I hear similarity. He was the first black to go to school. So what's happening here is talk to do ratio. We do a lot of talking and no doing. So we need to have a strategic plan. Plan number one. We must win this election. Now, we can get sidetracked on all this other stuff. Right, right, right. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Go. Talk to me. Yes, sir. The goal is to win this election. Now, we should have had a strategy of leadership for these young people that somebody was telling them, hey, man, hey, man, you need to register. And it's important that you go and vote. We must win this election or all of this Zoom talking and walking and happy talk. All of that is for not right. we don't right. win this election. So we can't stay off of strategy number one. Strategy number two, we have to have a vaccine or all our lives are going to be always quarantined. Mm. Strategy number three. Yes, sir. We got to replace some of these old people with new people in government. And we've got to fix all aspect of this structural, rep, uh, structural racism. But we first have to have the people in place. And that's a strategy. I believe all of my successes, I had a strategy, goal and objective, and how did we get there? High talk to do ratio, thinking outside of the box, and nobody telling us we got to do it this way because hey, I'm just an old guy. I'm saying this is the way it needs to be. We need to have a young person at the table every time. Should be a young person right now. And they might be saying, 
dang, y'all old dudes sound old. <laughs> True indeed. True indeed. That's, that's all I'll say. Okay, anybody else wants to jump in on that? <laughs> Where's, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Go ahead, go ahead, bro. Go ahead. Uh, I, I I totally concur, and, and my my daughter, as a as a, as a father of a da daughter who's one of the radical millennials, uh, they see the world differently from us. And she said, "Dad, I know you're a journalist; you have your ear to the ground, but you don't have your ear to the streets." She told me this yesterday. I have mm -hmm. my ear to the streets. She lives in L.A., mm -hmm. and she, you know, and, and she concerned me in the discussion because she is an advocate for the response that, that we're seeing that's disturbing. Uh, she doesn't want anybody to get hurt, but she said, we tried it Martin Luther King's way for years. Wow. It's still happening. And so that is the mindset of these young people who are leading the Black Lives Matter group, who I've interviewed in the past. They're very aggressive. They respect what has happened in the past, but they, they want to do it a different way. And they are aggressive. And that aggression is showing, shown not only in, in some of these outside, these outliers who are coming in, and uh, they, they don't count because they're, they're coming in to disrupt and to demean and to uh, belittle what's, what's happening. But the core group of those kids who are out there, they are on a mission to change things and they want to do it their way. They're not interested in marching and saying, we, we, we shall overcome and, and hoping. They're not even thinking about the vote. And that's where it was. I was very dis, dis. It was very dis. Uh, I was very disenchanted with my daughter yesterday because she said, "You know, I'm considering not even voting." And I'm like, "Wait a right. minute, right? We can't let this guy get back in and do another four years of this. We can't have that." And she went into, "Well, Biden is just as bad." I said, "No, he's not. Right. He may not be the answer, but nothing is going to change at all. It's only going to get worse if this guy stays in there." And by the time I finished with her, she had calmed down because she was so radical. Like, I'm moving to Africa, so I won't even be here. It's going to be your problem. I'm not here. I mean, she is part of that group that is very radical about it. They're serious. And I'm looking at a picture now in Los Angeles. I mean, it's, it's a huge gathering, and most of these are young, young folks. That's right. We have, to let them, we have to step aside and support them and, and try to offer advice when we can and try to keep them in line when we feel like they may be going too far. But we got to let them go and run this thing because they're the young people who, and I think the point about Martin Luther King being 23 and, and Malcolm X being so young, these, the, you know, leading these demonstrations, leading these a uh, whole race, that's pretty powerful. And, and we have to stop looking for Al Sharpton and Andy Young or whomever else, no disrespect to them. They're obviously amazing people. John Lewis, they've done great work. Right. But let's let these young folks take over and support them in their efforts to change things because but but number one, Mr. No, you're correct. We got to get this guy out of. Here. Yeah. We it, it, everything becomes exponentially dip, more difficult if this guy is in there spewing hatred and everything that he does every single day of his of his of his reign in the office. So that that's my thought. I I, I support the young folks. I think they're courageous. And I talked <clears> to a young man also. I, I'll say this last thing. I talked to a young man who got pepper sprayed in the face in the face Friday night in Atlanta. And he said, I'm, I don't mind. It was great. I'll do it all over again. Wow. This, he wow. started a group called Teenagers for Advocacy, 17 years old. And they're down there marching right now. He said, we're going to be 100% peaceful, but we're inspired. We're not taking this anymore. And, we, and, and it's not like we're not going to, you know, it's not like we want change. They said, we're going to, we demand a change. We're going to make it happen. So I support them. And I think that's probably the best method moving forward to support them and offer kind of, you know, fatherly advice where necessary, but definitely let them take the reins and, and run with it. I agree. Question though, the question that I have is, um, we talked about voting and that's very important because I've talked to a lot of young people and they feel that their vote doesn't even count. Why vote doesn't count. Now maybe with this, it might change a little bit. One of the other things that comes to mind is, okay, you, you, find a leader, you find someone who has the potential or they just, they emerge because that's who they are. Will they listen? Because right now what I'm seeing and, and correct me or jump in there, I see a lot of people walking around. I see them going down this block, that block. They're making their statement, but where are they going? Where are they going? I don't, I don't see many, many people speaking. I see a few. I want to know 
what is the end game even for them behind this particular protest? Now, what are, what are we accomplishing with this right now? And, and the other piece is you turn around and, okay, we move aside. We move aside, but they need to be mentored by somebody that has been there. Yes. And, the, and, and, and the third thing is this, you know, um, my son, I have a son, 17, you know, Martin Luther King, very long time ago. But I don't want, I don't want the young people to ever disrespect or forget the sacrifice that the people way before myself and way before a whole lot of people have had to endure so that we can at least be where we're at right now. Not that we're in a good place, but we're here. And, you know, I was born in 1957. And at that time, I remember, uh, you know, I don't actually, you know, I know I was born in a time where certain things that we and privileges we have now or certain rights that we have now, let me put it like that, we didn't have then. I remember my grandmother, my uncle, my older brother going to the March on Washington, fighting for those civil rights. It's a different method, but it still accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish for that period of time. So I'm trying to figure out right now, how do we step aside, but give them the proper tools to do it right? Because, okay, you're standing for something, you're marching, you get pepper sprayed, you go back out there. Okay, cool. What happens after that? What happens after they bring these other three officers in. What happens after that? Does, does everybody just go home? What do we do then? What do they do then? That's my question. So, so the, the piggyback off what you said, I mean, uh, all, of this, all of these things are necessary. For, so for one of the things that was frustrating in the last election is when you have influential people, not calling anybody out any of the celebrities' names, but when you have influential people that young people listen to and they tell you, don't vote, um, it's not important, um, that's right. just... That, that is the most insulting and most ignorant thing you could tell a young black person when you've had all of our people that have died and is, that were enslaved, our, our ancestors before that, all, even some of the good righteous white folks that fought for us to get the Civil Rights uh, uh, Act passed and tell people not to vote. Are you kidding me? You know, that's irresponsible when you have a prominent athlete or an entertainer saying, I'm going to stay at home. Oh, I'm gonna, I don't want to vote for the lesser of two evils. There is no, t are you kidding me? Okay. And you and we we are, the problem is we allowed the media to take over this thing. Right. When Donald Trump went around and started talking about Barack Obama and saying that he was not legit, every media outlet should have said, "Are you out of your mf in mind? Are you crazy?" The same way we get mad about black people step uh, go to a party and somebody step on your shoe. And you <laughs> <want> to, <laughs> Come on, brother. I mean, are you kidding me? We 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 don't know how to we know how to disrespect each other, but you got a man disrespecting the first black president, and we don't say a damn thing. Are you kidding me? So we've got to remind people what we just came out of, right? So I, I talked to a brother today. He called me, he texted me and on, on, uh, on uh, LinkedIn. He said, he, and I don't know the brother. He said, you know, do you think that um, they should be looting? And I'm like, who's they? I mean, wh who, who should be looting? Because he's black. He was like, do you think they should be looting? I looked for his phone number. I said, I'm not going to text this. I'm calling this brother. I called him up. I said, what do you mean are they, are they looting? He said, well, why, why are they looting? I said, well, I'm not justifying looting. I understand it. I'm not justifying. No, that's not proper. However, what you need to do is look at the fact that a good percentage of the people looting are not us, okay? And you have, you have outside agitators, which has been going on from the beginning of time to disrupt movements. That's exactly what's happening. And instead of us allowing this to happen, you, 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 you check the media and check social media and you make sure that people know. Dude, this is not 1950s and 40s when you're walking down the street, you're worried about getting lynched. Dude, this, those days are done, okay? There's a different kind of lynching. So right. you have the power of the internet. You've got the power of social media. There is no reason under the sun that none of us, we, 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 we put the videos out there. The problem is that, that there's, a, there's a gap missing. Back in the 60s, black leaders from the middle class and, and the poor communities, they, they, they trusted each other, believed each other. But then when the poor people, the people, when you had brothers moving to the suburbs and leaving a gap with the inner city, there was no mentorship anymore. So these young brothers and sisters, we can't, like Mr. No, like Brother No said, we can't sit back and let these young kids sit out on their own. There's gotta be right. some communication with his respect where you, we educate and empower, equip them, and they have the energy. The good thing is that I'm in the middle. I'm, I, just, I just turned 50. But so I'm at the university level and I'm at black and white school. So I get a chance to inspire and empower 
black kids to mobilize, teach them their history, get them excited and focused, right? But then go and talk to the white kids and educate them and get them where they're at and, and not talk down to them, but talk to them. Where right. they try. And you give them that and you tell them exactly what it is. What I did last week, this, this, everybody has a part. You don't have to be the, the person out in front. You don't have to be the person writing things. You could be the person giving information. You could be the person behind the scenes. Everybody has a part. We have a role. And everybody wants to be seen because of social media. Everybody doesn't have, So we need to do this. I had last week, when I, when I saw all my white friends saying, hey, uh, Dr. Williams, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. And I'm like, I'm tired of people saying they're sorry. What are we going to do about it? So what I did, I got a panel of white people, all white people, and, and just me, and I put my face on a flyer, and everybody thought, why is these white people talking about black people? Then I appeared, right? And I got eight righteous white people from the Republican, Democrat, everything to talk clearly about their privilege, why it is, and I put them all on the list So We've been talking for the last week on on uh, on Twitter on um on um on our text messages, and I I haven't said much on there. I, I what I did was I put I put a young white boy, he's twenty years old, mad conservative, and I put him in the room with all these white people who are you know, kind of liberal, and they have their PhDs, and they're the ones that are educating him and giving him knowledge. This brother now, he's a white kid, he's now putting Black Lives Matter on all his tweets now. This guy, y'all, he does a tweet about Trump, okay? He's got right. Black Lives Matter, and, I, and I'm not even talking. I got these white professors that are knowledgeable, that are smart. I got white young guys that have been following me since, since they were in, you know, in 10th grade. They're now like 29, 30 years old, and they're spitting fire every day. He's getting it, and now everything he speaks out is talking about relationships, God, and Black Lives Matter, my brothers and sisters. He's getting knowledge, so we have to not think about just us bringing us together. If we are, if we have access to white folks like I do, then we get a chance to also educate them in a way where they understand, but you hit them with things that they can relate to. So you use the incident about the, about Michael Vick and the dog. You use a relationship of imagine if your girlfriend or your mother was raped and other people you know was raped and you know who did it and they couldn't find their killer. What would you do? That they, they start thinking about, oh my God, I would do what they did in Michigan. Yes, I know you would. Why do you think black people ain't doing that? And then when you see the contrast of what's going on in Minneapolis, where they get the hell out of our people, and you see these men walk to they walked to to, to Michigan to the state capitol with guns and they, they handled them with kid gloves and you get the contract. You can't see that. And you show people that then they see it. But we have got to equip young people and not look down on them and talk to them and get them where they're at and give us, our, give them, give them your knowledge and our knowledge so that they can be equipped and then we can learn from them. And, and if we continue to keep doing that and don't let, don't let them up, it's like a box. You know, you got them on the ropes take them out. This is the time to take them out. I really think, I'm only 50, I'm probably maybe younger than everybody here, but let me tell you something. In my lifetime, I've never seen this many angry white people that, that seem to want to find an answer to this. I haven't seen it, maybe 9-11, but I don't, remember, I don't remember seeing this many people galvanizing, and we can't lose that. So I, 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 I'm just, this really inspires me, and I'm really passionate about this topic, especially now. It's my first time really speaking out about Talking about race because of my father and all I don't want to, I don't want to draw growing up. So I blended kind of in and kind of just kept my mouth shut on my consciousness. And I'm like, I can't do that anymore. So now the gloves are off. I've got to talk about this. I talk about empowerment a lot, but now I got to talk about race. I got to talk about racism. Absolutely. I was black men a disservice if I didn't. And so that's why, that's what we need to have more conversations like this that we take <clears> to <throat> And we take it to the young people. But we've got to get brothers like Olden Polonies and educate them about, it's not just about Scotty Pippen or Michael Jordan. They, they need to know a brother like you. They need to know a brother like uh, Abdul Rauf. They need to know about brothers that have done it. We need to put, we need to educate young people about our past. So that exactly. They I agree. So I'm, I'm done. I agree 100%. Uh, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Why are we seeing so many people from other races, from other ethnic backgrounds now joining this so fiercely. I mean, there's a lot of them standing side by side. And some of these, some of the protests, I see more of them than us. Why is that? Why is this generation, this, this young generation that's out there right now, what, what has changed from before to now that it, it seems like they, they're, they're getting something? What is it? And why is this happening? Can I touch on that quickly? Yes, sir. 
I, I think it's, uh, it's a result of integration. I think we're seeing the first stage of that. If you find someone 32 and younger, that their parents um, might have dated, might have been married. Uh, and, and, and I have two, I have a, a nephew that's 16. Uh, I have a grandson that's 15. And they both sound white as hell when they talk. Mm. Bugs the hell out of me. Their friends are white and they sound black as hell. <laughs> okay. The point is, is that these kids have gone to elementary school all the way up and they are connected. And, and through music, through social media, they are connected. So it's a different youth all the way around. It's a totally different youth. I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, this will take one minute. I just I think so. Go ahead, bro. Tell you this one thing. Some of you might have seen this. I hope I'm able to play it. Uh, boy, I'm not the, the best technical guy in the world. Of the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people, and we are tired. Don't talk to us about looting. Y'all are the looters. America has a looted black people. America looted the Native Americans when they first came here. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. We learned violence from you. The violence was what we learned from you. Come on. If you want us to do better, then damn it, you do better. Yes. And that's what I'm talking about, guys. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That generation, man. That's that generation. Yes, yes. In their 20s, I bet you. And I want everybody to know that that's Sister Tamika Mallory. That's Tamika Mallory. Oh. A tremendous activist, and we are going to have her on the show. I know her. We will oh. have her on. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's good. Question. Are you finished, uh, Dr. Nose? Yes, I am. Okay, question. I, 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 I want to get to the meat and potatoes of this. You know, I want to talk about us. I want to talk about us. I want to talk about our communities. I want to talk about what we do to each other. Because I believe, personally, that's one of our biggest problems is what we do to each other. I think once we find a way to fix that, a lot of things are going to change. And I'm talking about black on black violence, black on black hatred, black on black uh, crime, just just the whole mentality that we have when we talk about one another, the the, the separation of Jamaica to Haiti to America to Africa. I, I, I want to talk about that because I, I believe, and, 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 and I want to bring this up as well, the N-word, where I come from, I don't want you calling me that, but it's accepted today amongst the young people. I'm still offended by it. I don't use it. I don't call my brother or my sister that. And it disturbs me. But these people, the other people are saying, well, and you have to kind of understand it. If they're doing that to each other, why is it a problem if I do it? Why is it a problem if I call them the N word, you know, and, and, and I don't mean it in a vicious way. I couldn't care personally how you mean it. I don't like it for my own people, you know, so I definitely don't like it from them, but it seems that the younger people have adopted this and they put a twist on what it's supposed to mean to take away the power. I want to talk a little bit about that, how we, how we hurt each other. Can that be fixed? Can we ever stop that and learn to empower ourselves and depend on ourselves? Learn how to be what we're so actually supposed to be and what we, we know we can be. Stop being selfish in a lot of ways. There's a lot of good people, don't get me wrong. But how do we come from within and fix that in order to fix or at least alleviate a lot of the problems outside of who we are? I'm putting that on the floor. Well, can I start if I, I'll start? Absolutely. I mean, you put out a whole a cornucopia. <laughs> um, peace but, by peace, brother. Well, I won't address them all. I'll let some of the others who can who can speak much more intelligently about them. But I, 
when you talk about black on black crime, crime is a product of proximity. If black people live together, because there's no way in the world, no, there's no, it's, there's no race on earth where people don't commit crime. Right. There are all these people who are disturbed, who feel uh, disenfranchised, who feel hopeless, and they, they steal, they rob, they kill because there's it, whatever issues they may have. That happens with black people, that happens with white people. When I hear black on black crime, particularly in a, in a conversation, which is a totally separate conversation from what we're talking about, because that's not going to, has nothing to do with white people killing us. On, right. Um, white people, we never hear, what, what about white people solving white on white crime? 86% of the crimes uh, committed against white people are by, by white people. 92% of the crimes with black people are uh, committed against black people are by black people. So it's about 86%. That's a pretty large number, but nobody ever says anything about white on white crime. It's yeah. all about proximity. White people live uh, mostly around white people and the criminals commit crimes against the people closest to them. And that's what happens. That's the same in the black neighborhood. Can we solve this? People not hating each other and, and coming together. If we, if, if there were, if Wakanda was a reality, yes, but that's not the world we live in. <laughs> so it, it can't, it, that's not going to happen. We can strive for that. We can, we can obviously want people to do better and talk about doing better and try to teach our kids to do better and all the things that necessary that people have been doing all for in the, since the beginning of history, I would imagine, but we're not going to change the world so that the, the world is just unified, everybody's holding hands and there's no crime no, in the world. No, no, no. Right. That's not going to happen. So that's, I just wanted to speak to the black on black crime thing because obviously it's, it's, just, it's disturbing, it's a problem, um, but white on white crime is... Six percent less. Nobody ever talks about that. So, it, but it's really about proximity. The people you're closest to have you have access to. Those are the people who are the victims. Okay, I appreciate that. Very good point. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd like to say some right quick about that. Okay. Um, you know, I was born in Haiti, and so, you know, I've seen it. You know, I see Haitians fighting Haitians and all that. You know, right. but I always go back to the fact that you know. When we fought for our independence, you know, and, you know, being a tiny island nation and not knowing that until I grew up and got older, you know, and realizing the greatness of my people. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that comes with, you know, like Brother Curtis said, proximity. Yes, we are committing crimes. But again, that's their excuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's their excuse. That's their little thing, you know, to throw out there to justify them killing us. Ah, come on, brother. And I, don't us, and I don't like when my kids or people I know try to like, yeah, that is true. How, you know, no one talks about, you know, well, the people that got shot in um, Chicago last week. I'm like, wait a minute. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the fact that somebody got killed by a police officer who has sworn to protect and serve. That's the key. Pookie is not sworn to protect and serve. He's got to do what he wants brother. to do. Yes. Okay? So that's the difference. I don't like when they try to, like, justify them killing us. Where, well, black people kill. Well, so do Mexicans. So do the Yakuza in, in Japan. So does Chinese. So does all races, all cultures. We have issues. Cain killed Abel. Mm. Okay? You want to get biblical. So it's going to happen. It still doesn't make it right. So at the end of the day, you know, my thing is this. We can't lose focus on the issue, you know, because they always going to try to, like, change the narrative. My favorite quote is, you know, the history books will always glorify the hunter till the lion learns how to write. Mm. And so to <laughs> me, we have to really start writing all our narratives. Like uh, Mr. Knowles said, about getting young people involved. You know, one of the things that I did when my kids were young, my kids grew up all around white people. You know, being an NBA player, we live in, you know, affluent areas, and all their friends are white. They date white, they hang out with white. I get that. But at the same time, I still try to teach them the language. I still try to teach them history you know, about our brothers and sisters and not just, you know, the athletes, <laughs> you know, because I'm, you know, again, we've been entertainers for a long time for white people. 
Yeah. But I think we need to realize and understand, and like I try to share with all my kids, hey, we are a great people. And I'm a little bit embarrassed right now, and I'll be the first one to admit it. Listen to Mr. Knowles say, he mentioned the, being the first black three different times. That's right. And I should have known that. Okay? I should have mm. done research. I've been mm. in his company. I've been around him. I should have known that. And I think we do each other a disservice when we don't learn about one another's accomplishments. Wow. Yes. That's great. And promote. Yes. That's yes. profound, bro. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. I, agree. I agree. Thank you for that, man. Thank you. Brother Charles, That's help us. Yeah, so on that issue, Les, you know, um, I would say that I'm losing connection. Can you guys see me? Some yes. reason my screen is yes, going uh -huh. in and out. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, my screen is coming in and out. But, you know, I, I again, I echo the thoughts that were just shared. I think, by and large, the issue of black, so-called black-on-black violence is more than anything a function of a, a diversionary tactic, if you will. Mm -hmm. Because, again, if we can sustain this, this myth, this notion that we're out here killing each other in larger numbers. Of course, it masks and hides the real reality. I think part of our problem is that we have to really come up with a definition of this problem. You know, while we can identify instances of violence, we can look at, you know, the, the aberrant behavior of so-called law enforcement officers, others, so-called, you know, community uh, 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 neighborhood watch practitioners all over the place. <laughs> What's really happening, though, you know, this is a function of a continual, perpetual uh, white supremacy and, and, and hegemony. This is, this is an issue of white dominance. This, this issue of violence to keep us constantly in this, this, this perpetual box that we find ourselves in, I think we first have to identify and come up with a collective definition of the problem so we can all get on the same page. You know, I know we're gonna use some time here to talk about solutions, but if we can't at least first define the problem, then we're all going mm. off in different directions. Mm. So again, mm. when we begin to buy into this notion of black on black violence, I mean, we did studies while I was at the Los Angeles Urban League. And we, I mean, this, this conclusive evidence that suggests, which was already said here, we're not perpetuating violence on each other any more than elder people in their own community. In fact, mm. the numbers even seem to be less. But let, let, let's, let's keep the issue uh, uh, not focused on where it should be. Let's look at them as the problem Therefore, we don't really get to the solutions. Mm. Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's profound. Okay, I want to read something, and I want to. I want to keep the. We are here about racism. We are here about what we saw with uh, George Floyd. Um, I pulled something. I did a little research. This is what excessive force during an arrest universally means. Not that they practice it. There's variations from state, city to city and procedure to procedure. But this is what it says. It says, police are not allowed to use excessive force or treat the arrestee cruelty. This is a universal and protected by the U.S. Constitution. Generally, police officers are only allowed to use minimum a minimum amount of force necessary to protect themselves and bring the suspect into police custody. This is why people are advised to never resist, never to argue with a police officer, even if they believe the arrest is inappropriate. Now that statement <laughs> obviously is not ever followed because I think that it gives too much discretion who decides what is minimal force? Who decides who's being threatened but the police officer? What we saw the other day with that gentleman, with, with, with that gentleman that we lost, George Floyd, with a knee on his neck, there's no justification at all for that type of mm. behavior from anyone, police or anyone else. So my question to to you too, to you gentlemen, is when you first saw this, what was your first reaction mm. when you saw that video? And we can jump in there, whoever would like to take it. What was your first, your true first thought when mm. you saw that? Les, I gotta tell you, buddy, it took me back to an experience I had in the eighth grade in the Northeast Bronx, New York, when I saw a cop who, if you guys who are from that neighborhood remember 
uh, we call Big Red. R Big yes. Red was a uh, six foot five Irish police officer, and he literally picked the brother up uh, with his baton around his neck and choked him out until he fell to the ground. So that that certainly that image of Brother Floyd with with uh, Derek, whatever his name is, knee in his neck, brought me right back to that 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 experience and that memory. And I think that for me at a very early age really catalyzed my my sense of the of the and, and of the the enormity of, of what we're really up against here and again i go back to we continually define this thing in minimal terms what we're looking at you know in, in, in characterizing in a way of police violence it's more than that you know what i mean it, it, it's 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 an issue of a perpetual state of of suppression, of domination, of white supremacy. This, this is in fact a global phenomenon. And so we begin to really define our issue as it's being played out all over the world and stop looking at the, the, the remedies in very narrow, limited perspective of, if you would, civil rights. I mean, that, that, it's almost ridiculous at this point. You know, we're not gonna receive the kind of remedies that we want by addressing these, these one-off isolated instances. We have to really define it call it what it is, and come up with a cohesive strategy and a plan with some accountability for how we're going to get this, 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 this evil off of us. Okay. I, think, I think for me, when I first saw it, um, a couple of things. Um, the number one thing, before I can tell you what I saw first, is that what the brother just said, we have to have policies in place um, from, and not just in a local police, it should be something that's just like when they say the SAT, I think the SAT, the ACT, in order to get into college, there's got to be a way that has to be universally that these are things that you don't do if you're an officer. Isn't it ironic? He just read the policy. That was a policy he just read. They don't they ignore the policy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Follow what I'm saying. You read the policy, but then you enforce that if you do you violate these things, you will have these punishments. You will not get your pension. You will go to jail. What I'm saying, they haven't, they haven't enforced that. So you have to have more stringent policy, and then if you enforce the stringent policy across the globe, like Donald Trump keeps talking about Antifa, 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 Antifa. You're that upset about supposedly this, this group over here, but you're less upset about a black man being having his neck, having a knee on his neck. And so there's got to be a universal uh, accountability, not just the policy, but the accountability as far as if you do this, you are going to jail. The same way if you sell crack or if you smoke marijuana or whatever you do, whatever crime that that is, so police need to be held accountable just like regular civilians, and that hasn't happened. That's the problem, and we haven't, we haven't enforced it, it hasn't been pushed. So when I saw it, the first thing I saw was, uh, I'm like, oh, okay. Not that I'm, I'm immune to it, but I was like, hmm, because it all happened, there's three things that happened. You had Aubrey in Georgia that, that happened, okay? And I was like, okay, that's crazy. That reminds me of what I've seen in, on TV in the back in the day where they chase black men and, and, and they just grab them and, and snatch, snatch them up. Okay, that's, that's worrisome. Then I thought, I saw the, 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 the foot on the neck and I was like, okay, that's really out there. But the mm. thing that scared me the most was those two were, were scary, but the thing that got me the most was the white woman in Central Park. OK, that's the one that scared me the most, because I'm like this white woman is standing in front of the whole world with the camera in her face. They didn't care. And she proceeded to get louder and louder and threatened the, black, the brother and said, I'm going to say that you did this, even though she knew she was on camera. Mm -hmm. Because that's a narrative for white women. And what the scary part, what the interesting part was, because of all the history in Central Park, and let's say the dispatcher was a novice and they heard this. And they were like, huh, they called in five police guards came. This would have been Tamir Rice all over it again. They would have shot, shot first and asked later. And then said, oh, you were a hard regret? Oh, so bad. That, that scared me more because I was like, gee, I, I'm thinking about all the white women I come in contact with or have come in contact with or any woman. But a white woman, if she says something, that could be law. Even though it's not law. She should go to jail. But they're now debating whether or not she should go to jail. She should be held accountable. That's crazy. And what my thing is, when you create a false narrative and you lie, that you should go to jail for that. And if you do the thing that happened with the brother um, in Minneapolis, yes, everyone that does anything as far as excessive force, you shoot someone unnecessarily, you, 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 uh, you, you use the baton against someone unnecessarily, you're going to jail. And that should be case closed. 
period. And when that happens, because we can talk all day long about policy, but if those things are not enforced, we're going to have this, we're going to be talking about this 20, 30 years, and 40, 50 years from now. So the lawmakers have got to be committed. The Congress has got to be committed and say, hell no, this is it. We are not allowing this. You are going to jail. And when now people become police officers, they know, oh my God, I can't, I can't hit black people anymore. I can't choke them out anymore. I can't do this anymore. There's no fear because there's no punishment. Right. That's, That's true. Yeah. I, I just want to chime in, and this is more of a question. You know what's baffling to me, guys? I see all of these black mayors, mm. and the police chief is, I think, you know, last time that a police, police chief didn't report to the mayor was back in a, uh, L.A., uh, the, the Watts riots. But don't these police, police chiefs, report to the mayors and I'm seeing these black mayors and I'm like, how the hell do you allow this to happen? Mm. Am I wrong? Does the police? No, Yo, absolutely. I, I'd like to speak to that if I can. <laughs> you know, I, I think a big, uh, you know, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we had, and we talked about this earlier, when you talk about engaging, you know, the, the, the brilliance and the energy of our young people, I mean, look at the kind of, uh, the kind of response that came out of you know, in the 50s and the 60s, those brothers and sisters were in their teens, in their early 20s, mid 20s at best. So we have to appreciate the brilliance of our young people. But the apathy, by and large, I think is a function of the fact that we never really managed to translate the political gains that we achieved during the civil rights movement into institutional building. I mean, at the end of the day, yes, we have more mayors, we have more Congress people. We have more senators, governors, in fact, even to elected into the highest office. But by and large, it has not really affected the kind of material change in the conditions in the lives of our people, period. And that's on us. We did not, we did not handle our business with regard to institution building. So if we do anything at this point, and I'm, I'm certainly one to say, yes, certainly continue with the political process, create our own political movements, create our own parties, get into elected office, but take that power and turn it into an institution that will be able to hold these people accountable. Let me ask the brothers on this, 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 this panel a question. What happened to, where's our intelligence apparatus? How come we don't know that, that there is perhaps a, maybe a relationship between, you know, this Derek, whatever again, and, and, and the murderer of George Floyd? Or how come we don't know his history? How, do we know, how come we don't know his background? How come we didn't know there were numerous violations that he's been perpetrating on our, our community? Why do we leave it to others to try to figure out at the end of the day what's actually at the root of this thing? You know, where's our, where's our militia? Where's our paramilitary expertise? How come we're not patrolling and, 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 and protecting our own communities? We're going to have to or get off the, uh, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, man, that pen. You know, it's who's writing it, who's writing the narrative, you know, and it's, it's funny. I mean, that's how we've been. You're right. I mean, we watched this man kill the brother. <laughs> he did it knowing, nah, I'm probably going to get off. You know, that's their mentality. You know, I'm going to probably get on desk duty or maybe change their dress because that's usually what happened. They get, quote, unquote, fired. They yeah. go to another precinct. Oh, you the guy that killed the black dude, huh? Okay, come on. Mm. And so to me, one of the things that I love, I love watching movies because I've always been a firm believer that the truth is always in what they show us. And so, you know, one of the movies I saw recently, Live by Night with Ben Affleck, and he went to meet with a KKK member, you know, trying to build a casino. So long story short, so he goes in and meet with him, and then the, the gentleman goes, you know, you think that's all I am as a KKK member? No, we're bankers. We're, <laughs> we're mayors. We're police officers. We're... And so to me, we, got, we have to seek and recognize those things as well. You know, they just took off the sheets and put on uniforms. That's all. And so that's hurting us as well. Like you said, brother, it's like we don't have those resources in place to do those researches. And then when we do find out, unfortunately, then they like make us look real stupid. It's like they do the Jedi mind trick on us. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not true. Maybe, you know, oh, yeah. man. 
we get confused as hell. Yeah. Something as simple as today. You know, we're supposed to do the Blackout Tuesday. Right. That got all discombobulated. <laughs> you know, no, you're not supposed to post. No, you're supposed to post. No, you're... man, we have to wake up, man. Yeah. Seriously. Our people, mm. we got to do better, man. Mm. Yes. Yeah. No doubt. I agree. Mr. Bun. Yes. Can we hear I from did, you, brother? Because I know yeah, you see something. Well, see, the, the, the power, uh, when we talk in policy, the power of white supremacy is that that man can stick, sit on his this man's neck with his knee, with his hands in his pocket, like he's just chilling. Like it's right. a day in the park. Right, right. Understanding right. That the likelihood that I'm going to go to jail is, is minimal. That's right. That's the that's the power of this white supremacy that this brother's talking about. It is there. And so the reason he feels that way is because when he goes to court, the lawyers, the judge, the jury, you know, when we talk about a jury of our, of our peers, what does that look like? You go back to Rodney King, Rodney King beat up in LA, goes to the Simi Valley, all white jury, those guys get off. Um, and, and there are many other cases, George Zimmerman. A jury of your peers is a jury of the not the victims' peers, but the the the, the, the perpetrators' peers. Mm -hmm. And so he, they're confident in what they do. So the policies are in place. There's no policy to chokehold a guy. Eric Gardner, uh, when Eric Gardner died in New York, the baton at the neck was outlawed. That was not a, a, a legal procedure, and yet they do it because they think they can get away with it. Right. So policies don't really matter if you don't follow, them. and then and they don't follow them because there are no repercussions because yes. that's, that's the power of of, of of white supremacy. So how, how we combat that is going to be uh, where we really make some inroads. Mm. Mm. But you know, brother Curtis, you bring up a valid point, but I also it goes back to the structural racism, and when we look at criminal justice system, think about it. The prosecutor, the police is always a friend of the prosecutors. These police mm. go to court day after day after day after day, and they're not on the defense attorney's side. Come on. They're on the prosecutor's side. So that's why they feel this comfort level because, hey, I know Billy, I know Mary, we go drinking, you know, mm -hmm. we go down. That's where that structural racism because we've got to touch all those touch points i've been guilty i've been guilty of voting and not looking at the judges Ooh, come on keep it real mr no i just wanted to get the hell out of there i voted for the president da, da, da. That's yeah. right. but hey i learned i've got to look at all of it's an education that we have to also give our people the importance of this, importance of, look at, you look at 76, I think is the number percent of all prosecutors are white. 76%. Wow. And then you got Asians, black and browns, we don't stand a chance. Mm. And, 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 you know, is it a, is it happenstance that when you look at the prison system, the mostly brown and black, I don't understand, and I don't know about y'all guys, but what's been baffling to me is when I watch this TV and I keep seeing white policemen, I'm like, where the hell are the black policemen? Are there any <laughs> black policemen? Like, what, what happened? And it's just that, I'm telling you, I, I, I feel that deep inside, man, that chaotic part of myself. When I see these police, it takes me back to 63 when I was 13. And how they hold these billy cl clubs is the same way they held those billy clubs back in the 60s. That intimidating, I'm going to beat your butt. And I, and I saw some of the police forces, they didn't hold their billy clubs that way. And why is Houston a little different? It's a lot different, quite frankly, because our police, police chief came to the inner city and said, hey, what happened was wrong. I want y'all to hear from me. He should be in jail for a murder. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's that. You know, I'm proud of Houston. You know, our last three mayors have been this. 
uh, outwardly said she's gay. Black mayor, black mayor. We had 23 black judges this last election. And, and that's why you had 65, 70,000 people orderly today. It can be done. And it was a lot of young people running. A lot of young people running. And I saw young people with water and the, the roller thing. It was organized and I was very proud, man. We just gotta have this leadership and we've gotta let these young people, we've said it over and over, and we've gotta mentor them. Yes. You've got to mentor them. And, and as black men, we've got to take the responsibility of mentoring one young black man. We've got to go occasionally into schools and, and talk to these, these junior high students. You know, we've got to go and stop the bleeding, man. You know, we, that collateral damage, we might have lost some. And I realize that. And I know it's awful to hear me say that. But we might have, mm. but in war, you realize you're going to lose some. It's about the good of all. And, and so when I saw that, all I can say, and I keep repeating it, because I'm a father like most of you are, I can't breathe. Mm. The knee on my neck. I can't breathe, sir. Mama. I mean, that's what I keep hearing this, yes. this black man say, and that's what we all are saying is that this is this is slavery. We talked about why do we hate on each other? Not slavery. Mm. Why, why do we so many in jail after slavery? That's what happened. They they start putting every uh, had another slave called a prison, and they right. get all work for free. Why all of this is slavery, man? And my great grandfather was born a slave so this had been long ago we keep thinking this is so far away mm -hmm. these people still have this belief system and, and we can't keep talking that's what i love about these young people they said we're not talking mm. we're gonna do it yeah some of it might be destructive right it might be and yeah we might give our, our lives i mean we, nobody's talking in the media about the there are eight people in St. Louis that's died in the last three days. In the last night, a black man got killed, and they were supposed to have, the police were supposed to have that uh, uh, recorder on their, what do you call it? Body thing? cam. The body cam, thank you. And uh, they, they refused to have it on. And, and you, know, the, you know, we just got to, <sighs> I'm just glad I'm here, man. I'm just glad that I have an opportunity to talk with all each of you. And I just think, brothers, we got to do this more. I would love, I would just love if that young lady had a chance to talk to us. Mm. What, what's her name? Uh, what's her name, uh, brother, professor, young lady on the, on the video? Yeah. Which Tamika one? Mallory. Man, I would, I would really love just to have her talk to us tonight. And what would she say to us? Mm. We're going to reach out to her for sure. I'll get her. Yeah, we're going to reach yeah. out to her. Uh, uh, I'd like to say one thing Go ahead. about uh, we, we were talking about cops and holding them accountable. Mm -hmm. One of the most disturbing aspects of this, and, and uh, Brother Knows asks about where the black cops. In, the, in middle America, you, you're going to find little to none. But in some of these major cities, you have black cops. And they're complicit in their silence. Exactly. In South Carolina, some officer shot a guy in the back six times, um, maybe two or three years ago. Didn't know it was captured on video. Right. He said that the guy had gone for his taser. After he shot him, he went and put his taser by his body. And the white, a black officer, a female officer, was right there. It's already captured on video. So when they came to take the report, oh, look, my, my taser's on the ground. He tried to take my taser when he had actually shot the guy from 15 feet away. Yes. They both end up going to jail. But this black woman let this officer shoot this man in the back six times, kill him, and, and was an alibi for him. That's where the problem lies, too. These guys are se uh, selecting blue over black. 
they this code of conduct that they have, this super duper hypnotism that's going on within the police department where these black officers won't hold mm. white officers accountable is very disturbing and is, is pervasive. And there are many times they've seen these guys do stuff, if, if not captured on camera, right there in front of them, and they don't do anything. They, they, they stay quiet, and it emboldens them to do it more because they don't say anything when it's not on camera. And then when it's on camera and it's a major case, they still don't say anything. And so we, those are the guys we need to have hold accountable. In Atlanta over the weekend, two uh, black college students, Morehouse and Spelman students, got pulled out of a car and tased. Yes. yes. One of the officers who did it was black. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the black community is in sense with this guy. Like, why are you doing it? <laughs> so he's caught up in this whole wearing this uniform, sort of like the guy who works at a nightclub who is a loser, but he lets people in, so he has juice for those four hours while he's at work. And right. So now he's a big guy, and it's the same with these guys with a badge. And, and the uniform. So it's very disturbing that a black cop would allow white folks to do, white officers to disabuse us repeatedly in their presence and they don't say anything about it. And so that's an issue that we really have to, uh, you know, when we start talking about police brutality and policy and what, what we, you know, I think the black officers need to have a policy that if you do that in front of us, I'm going to stop it. You know, and, and I saw an article just about in, in Minneapolis, there's a, a beef between black community and the Asian community. As you know, one of those officers in Minneapolis was Asian. Who yes. stood hard while, the, while one had his knee on, on George Floyd's neck and the other two held him down. And so for him, it was like, I don't like you because you're black, so I'm not going to say anything. He had every opportunity to say to him, okay, that's enough. Oh, the man's unconscious. The man is calling for his dead mother. That ought to tell you something right there. A grown man, come on. So, you know, these, these other officers who watch these crimes to, uh, in front of them and don't do anything is a real, real problem. And that's why these other three officers have to go to jail, have to be charged with murder. And Absolutely. if they don't, the unrest that we're seeing now is going to escalate. It's not going to end anytime soon. If they come back and say, oh, well, these three guys, we found that we did an investigation and, you know, they were there, but, you know, it was really on the other guy. No, it's going to be holy hell if those guys don't get arrested and, and soon, in fact. I, I totally agree with you. Let me ask you, let me ask you guys a question. You just mentioned some some important stuff, uh, Curtis. Why do you think someone, a, a police officer, a black police officer, would not say anything? What what's what is the motivation for that? Are they in fear of retribution? Um, what is it? What would make someone do that? I I, I just can't even understand that. To to watch some, and I know the case you're talking. We all know the case you're talking about. Shot the guy in the back. And this woman said nothing act, and, and covered for him? What would make, and, and not just her, all over the place, why would they do that? Is, is it fear? You go back to the precinct? Do they threaten you? Well, what is it? I, I, I don't get it. It's a code. I don't get it, man. It's a code. I mean, I, I mean I'm in a fraternity. So I met, you know, Brother Knowles, we're in a fraternity. And I've been in situations, and I haven't done it, but I've been in situations where I see brothers, or I've seen, I know of brothers that might molest or rape somebody. And it's like 50, 15 or 20 of them, and they won't say anything about it. It doesn't matter that they have a sister, or they have a mother, or a grandmother. People have that code of, they have that code. I don't believe in it at all, but I've seen it in white fraternities. And if you're talking about the mentality, the mob mentality, I've seen that before, white and black fraternities and sororities, where people see people. Think about how many times you see black fraternities, look at us for a second, that get suspended because of hazing, for example, right? So many times, brothers don't say anything. And there's, a, there's also that mythology of where you have brothers that want to get made properly because hazing is supposed to have got to been you know, eliminated in 1989. So brothers now, they want respect. They want, to get, they want to get that respect. So they go underground and they get their asses kicked, right? So they had that, that bond of where they're like, we, we, we'll never tell about anything that happens. So I've seen it up close and personal where brothers will sit there and knowing that somebody's got killed, getting killed, knowing that somebody's getting molested or hurt, and they won't say a word. And that's that's us. Oh, that's us. That no white people involved. So think about that when it comes to police now, where you have a badge, a gun, you prestige, whatever you got, and doesn't matter if you're black. They all gonna stick together. And it, so it, so it's not a it's not shocking or surprising. To go back to the point earlier, 
about what are some of the things we could do. Back in the 60s, they used to keep records. They used to have committees where black officers would sit down with the community and they would be able to be telling you what was going on in the precinct. See, we need to start uh, requiring, I know it sounds radical, but requiring for police departments to put out the same way if you're going to bring a professor to your university. Everybody and their grandmother gets to come and hear that person interview, everyone in the community. So when you bring a new officer in, we want to know who they are, we want to know what their record is, and we want to know what they've done before they got here. Mm. And therefore, the community can help decide on who gets to be the police. See, they do that at universities, they do that in corporations, why can't we do it with the police? And we're at, we're at that stage right now, mm. because we, we, we don't know. We don't know who's coming into our community, we have no idea, mm. okay? And the fact that this brother had all these things, this white, this white man had all 18 different charges, Right. And FBI knows about it. They know about it. And why are they complicit in it? So the point is that we now have to say, you know what? Get up, hit them with their pockets. Look, my point is that you've got, you've got to do things radical, like maybe not, maybe not affect the economy or whatever it is. If it's looting or whatever, I'm not justifying that. But we've got to be radical and say, these are, our, these are the things that we want. And if you don't give them to us, then we're going to do X, Y, and Z. But we've got to hold the police accountable, hold the, the mayor accountable, hold the governor accountable and make sure that they provide us the resources we need to make sure that we get with the black officers and the community and make sure that they're serving on committee to let us know what's going on in the department and we hold them accountable that way. And if we don't do that, and if you don't come to them with that, people will say, well, Mark, they're not going to give it to you. How do you know? How do you know? Do you, yeah, you know, maybe that's the opportunity that we have. Is yeah. The opportunity is maybe to hold this black police officer in Atlanta accountable. Maybe we should be asking for his termination. He got fired. He got fired. Yes, yes he did. <laughs> good. <laughs> Very good. Some of them got fired, as a matter of fact. Good. Yeah. Very good. One of the things I want to say, too, when I first uh, saw the video of George Floyd, one of the things that 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 really, you know, Dr. Knowles, you said it, you know, when he called out for his mother, when he called out for his mother, grown man, and I, I remember being a kid, the only time I called out for my mother was either I was doing something wrong or I was getting my butt kicked or something, but I'm trying to get out of there, right? Um, and it, it, just, it just touched me so, so heavily because I think he knew, you know, he said it, he, he said it, and he knew what was happening to him while it was happening and we actually witnessed by this video these people <clears throat> actually killing this man on the spot because he was dead on the spot there's no question about that he was a non-responsive he didn't have a pulse and when emt shows up they normally try to revive someone you didn't even see that all they did was drag this man across the ground and put him on the gurney and put him inside that in, inside that vehicle well the other they thing yeah. Say that again. They were not EMT. Well, who were who they? Those two, there were two officers. Okay. That's what if they were. Look at the video, if you look at the video closely, it was not EMT. They were in full uniform, bulletproof vest on and everything. Okay. And they just okay. picked them up and threw them in the van. There were two officers. Now, from a that, different section or whatever, but they were officers. They were not EMT. Okay. So is that the reason why nobody checked for his post? Is that the reason? They're not EMT. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying now, I'm just, I'm just making, I'm making the point that nobody, when they asked, the, when, when they said the man is not breathing, not any of these cops, not the guys, the non-EMTs, nobody tried to administer any care. type of aid to this guy. You know, you know, yes, I, you know th this is not an answer to your question. This is, this is more of an observation. <laughs> But I think there's something that we, we just, I think the, the insidiousness of this thing is just something we refuse to accept. I think the diabolical nature of what we're looking at is something that our yes. own constitutions can't even manage less. I think we, we, can, we continually dance around this issue of what's really going on. You know, we call it, you know, police abuse, excessive use of force. We have nice terms. We like to talk about, you know, maybe it's a lack of training. Maybe it's a, a implicit bias, all these nice little terminologies we have, the labels. But I think at the end of the day, what we actually witness, and we refuse to accept the fact, we That's witness a murder. a murder. That's exactly the point. Color. Yes. I mean, how is it that, the, how is it that the, 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 I believe the initial traffic stop 
wasn't even made by the, the officer that wound up killing him. Didn't he come on the scene later? Yeah. And look at his history. I mean, how do we know that a call wasn't placed? And it, that sounded like, hey, man, we got one. He's pinned down. Come on in here and do your thing. I mean, it, it sickens me to even have to think more or less talk like this. But I think, it's, I think somewhere we have to begin to really, really examine what are we looking at. They knew he was dead when the other so-called, I mean, you said it wasn't an EMS. If the other first responder, the other police officers came on the scene, they knew he was dead. You know, so, so what we need to be talking about is what's the end game? What are they trying to provoke us into? And quite frankly, the civil unrest that we see, the, the, the disturbances, the so-called disturbances, protests, the, the, the frustration and anger that we witnessed, I, I guarantee you a large part of this community is probably looking at this as, wait a minute, we go back to Eleanor Bumpers? That's right. Michael Stewart? How many names of 100 and what? I don't know, was it, was it over 100 black people killed in the United States? Uh, I believe by law enforcement in the year 2015. It's, it's amazing that it took this long for this, this kind of response. We need to look at this. That was an orchestrated murder, Les. I mean, we need to really be, be clear about what we're really talking about here. Yeah, we watched the murder. We actually yeah. watched a murder take place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And then, you know, what's so, what's so bold about it? He put his hands in his pocket and he posed yeah. for the video camera. Right. Yeah, right. Now, that's, like a that's big game bold right, right there. Right? You take down some big balls game. Right there, that's man. the photograph that you take, right? Yeah, you got some balls right there. And, and, and you see him leaning, leaning forward with your hands in your pocket and you're leaning forward to apply more pressure. Right. And you, yeah, and, because you know, the, 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 rules, the rules of engagement went out the window because if he's handcuffed with his hands behind his back, right. there is no more threat. Right. And so that's why I'm saying, I don't know how long it's going to take for them to come with a new charge or whatever, but it's like, come on, man. That's what's <laughs> sickening me about this. He's not a threat. He wasn't a threat based on what he was being accused of. Forgery? You know how I many white people forge stuff? Well, come first, on, of all, dude. first of all, and I mean, why are four officers there for that? One of us could be walking around with a counterfeit fit bill. Right. right. I might have a counterfeit <laughs> money in my pocket I got from That's the right. ATM. That's Shit. Right. Right. You know, right. I don't know. Right. And, and many times I've been offended when they look up and with the market, you know? Uh, you know, so, you know, I, that, uh, to say the guy had a counterfeit, I, we, don't, we don't know that. This guy might have just got a bill from somebody. That's true. Where do you guys see this case going legally? What do you see? Let's, let's, let's talk about a little bit about the charges that were, were brought against him. Where do you see with the other three? Um, and where do you see this ending up from your, from your opinion? Where, where do you see this going? Yeah. Well, I hope it ain't status quo. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that. I hope it's not status quo. Dallas is golden, so, huh? Wow. So it came out with third degree. Yes. And I was like, wait a minute, third degree? That's, you know, I watch enough Law and Order to know the difference between third, second, and first. And we, again, we witnessed a murder, you know, again, based on what you read and what the rules and regulations are supposed to be, okay, the man was handcuffed. There was no need for the, for the extra stuff. So I'm assuming they're going to go with first degree on, on, on Chauvin and accessory on the other three. Right. It has to be. Right. Because again, any one of those guys could have been a man. Any one of those other officers could have been a man and say, hey, come on, man, that's too much. Hey, you know, right. at right. any point in time. That's right. You know, grow some balls. Be a man. That's right. Dr. Knowles. You, you yeah, again, we still have this this challenge, and that is already, you know, we got a secondary report, but the preliminary autopsy was a lie. But then right. when this, this officer goes on trial, the prosecutor is somebody that he knows. That's right. Uh, and this thing could go any kind of way. I'm, I'm disappointed because the attorney general of Minnesota is black. This is supposed to be the head attorney for the whole state. I, I get confused and baffled by some of this stuff. And he had to sign off on those charges, even though, you know, he, he well, not so much sign off, but the, the county attorney is the one that signed off on those charges. Am, am I correct? It was I the county know. attorney. 
Um, yeah, it was the original county attorney. Then they appointed yeah. this gentleman afterwards. So he has a he has a he has a large large job ahead of him because he's fighting not only the truth but he's fighting the facts and the the facts of lies and and everything else and the normal the normal way of doing business that they normally do and then they have an investigation now at the mini uh, Minneapolis uh, Police Department. I understand there's some investigation that came out today. Uh, have no, you heard less, about that? Less. I think the brother yeah. the brother that's actually going to adjudicate this this uh this, this so called. <laughs> you know, trial, if you would, um, is in fact the, the Attorney General of the state of Minnesota. And, but you know, interestingly, he was the only person that I've heard thus far that has conceded that there's still the spirit of domination in America that, that you know, that this country has never addressed. He did talk about the historic racism um, that still exists. So at least, at least given you know, his sensitivity to those issues, perhaps this thing will be looked at within the context of that, of that larger question. Right. At least, he did raise, at least he did raise the issue. Right, but he's not, the, he's not the one that brought the original charges. That's what I'm saying. No, 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 no. No, but, he's, he, but he is now, the case is now going to be heard right. by his office. Exactly. Right. Yes. So, he, so, so there's a chance of, of fairness because he's not this guy's friend. Right. And he, Keith Ellison is a strong guy. He's smart. He's a dogged. He's going to get them. He's going to get them all. I, I, I'm confident. I can't think any other way. I can't live in this world and think that these guys are going to get off, even though I've seen it happen so many other times. <laughs> I feel the same way as you. I just can't see them getting off. I just can't. I, have to, I, have I can't to believe that for my I, I might have to grab a brick if they get off. Yeah, me. I might be right with you, brother. For real, because this that's going to be incredible. Man. Yeah. I think, Such a tragedy. I think in the past, you really didn't have people like Keith Ellison. Keith Ellison's a warrior. He's a He's someone who's vigilant. He's someone who's known to uh, be a champion of civil rights, but he's also someone who's socially conscious. And, and he, we have all the evidence. And you got someone like that. So you in the past, one of the things that's happened, we haven't had someone like him that's going to – and plus, the world is watching. It's a little different. The world is watching before in other high-profile cases. But I think this time, I think it's a little different. I, I just got a feeling it's a little different. And, and like you said, older brother, brother, brother Polonies – I think I'm gonna grab a brick too. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. We have yeah. no choice, gentlemen. We have five minutes left, right? My last question: How do how do we move forward? What would be your number one first move uh, moving forward in a situation like this, and and the things that we've talked about tonight? What would be your first step of action? If accountability, okay, that's number one. I okay. think one of the brothers mentioned it. Tying everything, because at the end of the day, let's let's be real. White people understand dollars and cents. Gotcha. Okay, they don't have a lot of common sense, but they do know dollars and cents. And to that, I say, you go after the pensions, you go after the insurance companies, because they're not going to want to keep giving you insurance. You get in all these lawsuits. Mm -hmm. We have to hit them where it hurts. It has to be financially. Nothing else has worked for us. You know, this whole thing is about haves and have nots, realistically. Okay. We got to be honest about this. They have, so because they have financial backing, financial leverage, yes, they can have 76% um, district DAs. They can have all the best schools. They can have all the advantages because they have the power and the leverage financially. And some way, somehow, we do have some black billionaires out there. We got to tap into these people. Yes, we do. Because we got to hit them where it hurts. And it's going to come down to finances. Mm -hmm. You know, if we hit them in, with their pensions, you know, you kill somebody, you lose your pension. Trust me, all this stuff will probably drop them dr drastically. Thank you. Thank I, you. Think, I think that's a strong point. And uh, just to, to talk about something different, I'd say that we have to embrace these young folks that we talked about, guide them, support them, but also instill in them the value of the vote because that's what scares me. Um, in 2016, there, there was all this discussion about, you know, Bernie, they, wanted, they supported Bernie, they were feeling the burn, and when Bernie, uh, it was some underhanded stuff with the DNC, when Bernie got pushed aside and Hillary became the nominee, so many of them didn't vote. And when right. you look at the breakdown of these in this of this uh, electoral college and how many black people didn't vote in these key states that somehow became key states, 
and the number of votes where uh, Hillary lost versus the number of black people who didn't vote, it, it's, you know, if we had come out in half of the numbers who that didn't go out, then we would have a different president. And we would have a different call, different, at least a different feel in this country right now. I'm, I'm convinced of that. So I, I'm, I'm saying that the, the key thing right now is getting this guy out of office. We cannot have this guy in starting uh, another year, another four years of this nonsense every day, raising my heart rate individually, but also the <laughs> anxiety because he's such a he's such a loser. I mean, this is he's almost the devil incarnate, mm. and he's and he's actually you know he's 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 a racist and he's targeting us. He doesn't care what happened to George Lloyd. You saw that last night when he spoke about militarizing the government. I mean, the, the, the military against American citizens. Yes. He has no empathy for what happened to that family and, and to our people. So we've got to encourage our young people to vote, vote ourselves, and get this guy out of office. That's got to be the first thing right now uh, That's for right. me. Dr. Williams. I think... Um, Everything everyone's saying is, is accurate. And I think that there's gotta be different approaches. But one thing we didn't touch on tonight, and I'm sure we could do it, uh, it's another topic, another uh, subject is, is, is how we talked about uh, educating and teaching our young people about how to um, demonstrate better or to have an end result. What we need to talk about too, we not I know we can't do it tonight, is talk about the post-traumatic slave syndrome, okay? Mm. Let's talk about how we equipped our kids, okay? Because a lot of times you've had that mentality of like you say, hey, someone says, oh my God, your kid is so smart. Oh no, when you see him at home, he's so he's terrible, he's bad. We have got to encourage and empower our young kids. And I know during the pandemic, it must've been stressful for parents to be around their kids all day where teachers constantly have to deal with it. But teachers are the ones outside the parents that had the biggest influence on the kids. So if the kid is going to school and he's not being empowered or motivated, and he's being told, you know, certain things about who they are. I mean, Jay Z has a song with Pharrell called, you know, um, you know, he he, uh, he talks about, you know, I, I feel so inspired with what my teacher said. He said, "I'll be dead or be a reefer head." Mm. I'm just, I'm not sure that's how you speak to kids. But all I was trying to do was speak in class, right? And the point is that we have got to reaffirm our kids if they're not being reformed at school. Reaffirm our kids to make sure that they are equipped with being confident being strong, being empowered, so that when they go out there and they protest, it's not just doing it because that's the only thing they have in their life, right? We want them to have other things. We want them to be equipped. So my number one thing is making sure that we equip our kids with being confident, being proud, being strong, but also equip them with making sure that they feel educated and they're ready to go to war and, and, and incorporate all the other things so far what the other brothers have said. And I think those are some of the formulas uh, that, that can also continue to keep this thing going. Thank you, thank you, brother Charles. Final words. Oh, Les, this is this has been a, a, an incredibly informative dialogue, man. And I, I feel blessed to be have been a part of it. You know, I think moving forward, uh, you know, I think it's time for us to really take a real hard, critical look at our condition here in this country. You know, I mean, we we have more uh, uh, at stake than I would think any other so-called ethnicity here. We've been in this land. We would like to say that, you know, for the last 400 years, but quite frankly, as, as, as people of color, of, 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 of African descent, we've been here for centuries. We're inextricably tied to the land. This is our country as much as it is as anyone. But when we look at our relationship, how we've been pinned into this, this notion of, you know, the United States of America, I think we have to recognize that this system was effectively designed to keep us locked into uh, this endless web of policies, laws, and conditions really keep us locked into a position of being subjugated. I think we need to take a hard look at that. And, and at the same time, I think we need to look at the condition of others who are suffering the same kinds of atrocities around the world. You know, somehow, by and large, we are always the ones that seem to spark global uh, acknowledgement of conditions. When you look at civil unrest and, 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 and protests going on in Brazil, all over the world, we always seem to spark these things off. I think it's time for us to create linkages with other global efforts and stop defining ourselves as solely, you know, under the, if you would, rubric of the United States of America, if that makes any sense. We keep trying yeah. to find our remedies in the courts, you know, in, in legislative remedities. You know, this is, a, this, is a, this is an issue of human rights 
as much or more than civil rights. And I think we need to look at what's going on around the world and recognize we're part of those struggles and link up in solidarity and, and, and collective action as well. Thank you. And I'm going to leave it to our elder statesman, um, Dr. Knowles. Dr. Knowles. Yes. Well, Are you there, brother? The, the question was, what would be the single thing? And I was thinking as you brothers were talking, and it, it made very, very clear sense to me that we need to have a strategic plan. And that would be all of the things that you said, because they all make sense. Yes, sir. Uh, and those are very good points that the brothers brought up. Very good points. I think in addition to that, I would add the one thing is we have to identify our next leaders. We should have the three or four people identified. That's where our age and maturity and experience come in, that we can be a support mechanism for them. We should have them in a room. We should be, what is your agenda? How can we help you? That's our role now. Uh, and, and I don't see that happening. I don't see, uh, I don't know who the next leaders are. Right. All we know is who we have. Uh, and, and we have to have a leader. And I think that leadership has to be taught in school, at home. Uh, we, we, we're not talking about the word leadership. Uh, and, and then lastly, uh, I just like to leave you guys. I always say this everywhere I go. I was going down an escalator at the LAX airport years ago and a, a nun from Mexico gave me this business card and she uh, was asking money for the missionary. And I, I don't, I don't, I judgment. I used to judge, Oh, what you going to do with this? Uh, I don't do that anymore. I, I gave, uh, gladly gave. And, and I didn't read the back of that card because I have a habit of putting cards in my pocket and then put them in the next pocket. <laughs> now, I finally read the back of the card, and that's what I like to leave you, brothers. It said, pray not, for, pray not for a life free from trouble. Pray for triumph over trouble. For what you and I call adversity, God, the universe, Allah, whoever you might please, calls opportunity. See, we have an opportunity right now. We've been given an opportunity through all of this. And it's up to us to define what that opportunity is. And I think we all said it tonight. I think we're all leaving here tonight with a strategy. We should write this down and memorialize it and get it out. We need to show, hey, we didn't just talk. Right. This is what we ended up with. Our Seven point strategy, whatever we call it. I hope we do that. I hope yeah. we don't just let this be another Zoom meeting. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. And you know what? And with that being said, I'm going to I'm going to challenge each of us here tonight that we come back again. We have this conversation part two. And we come back with some of those those ideals and some 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 methods of moving towards action or bringing the action one way or the other come back again and i'm going to ask you gentlemen i'm going to invite you now same people on this panel to come back meet again when it's convenient for everyone and we come back with a different narrative on action we come back with a, not so much the solution but at least a course for solution something that'll help us move forward and pick those young people pick those uh, those leaders, mentor those leaders, something that makes sense that's going to put us in an action position, not just a conversation. One, one question, one thing real quick. I just read on the internet that George Bush, George Bush, George W. Bush, he just endorsed Joe Biden. Whoa. Oh. oh. Really? Him and, his wife, him and his wife came out with a very powerful statement about the injustices of racism and even talked about Frederick Douglass and their statement is crazy. Speak on it. Wow. Yes. Yes. Why? Well, yes, okay. Lauren and I have, are anguished by the brutal suffocation of George Floyd and disturbed by the injustice and fear of suffocate our, in our country. Uh, this is not the time for us to lecture. It's time for us to listen. 
Um, but there's more more to it in, in there. But that's the basis of it. There, he's endorsing Trump. He's not endorsing Trump. Endorsing uh -huh. Biden. That's big. Yeah, that's excellent. Okay. News flash. News flash. That was wonderful. You did a Curtis Bun. You put on your journalism hat. Fantastic. <laughs> and and the olden brother, olden Polonies, uh, Wahoo Wah. My, my, my whole half my family went to UVA, so Wahoo Wahoo Wah. <laughs> Wahoo Wah. It's Charles B. I worked at 125 North Veneto in Pasadena for eight years. Ah, I know the location <laughs> very well. <It's> zero <laughs> So let me ask one last question, Mr. Knowles. Uh, yes. What fraternity? Omega Psi Phi. Woo! I, I already knew. I, I kind of knew it when he was talking about rape and all that stuff. I kind of knew. We don't do that. Hey, I'm a sigma, so blue fight. All right, but it's great that brothers can laugh. We can leave laughing. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Yes, um, and that that and that really speaks to our indomitable spirit. You know what I mean? You yeah. know what I mean? We always gonna come up. We always gonna see our upside of things, regardless. Yeah. Right. I just want to yeah. say, um, yeah. yes, I want to personally thank Dr. Ben and, and um, just the opportunity of fellowship with brothers that are much wiser than me that's been, that's been, that's been around and been able to election tell me things that I need to hear. I did a lot of, t a lot of, I've been writing a lot. We talked about coming back. I've, been, I've written five pages of notes. So I've, I've been inspired by this. So thank you brothers for wow. uh, beautiful. Same here. Same here. Same here. Gina, you see what black men do? You yeah. <laughs> together? Hey, black men. That's right. Hey, yo, y'all all yeah. gained the, Y'all get another brother, man. My name is Les Boogie from New York City. All right, man, you got right. another kid, right, folk, baby. gentlemen. You got another kid, folk, man. And I appreciate y'all because you know what? Like Charles said, it's it's been it's been an enlightening, intelligent. You know, I've been inspired. I've not only been inspired, but but I've been impressed. I've been impressed by each of you, uh, Doctor Knowles. You now have a little brother, uh, and, and you you can adopt me. Uh, it's all good. You know what I'm saying. And, I just want to say to the professor, my man, thank you so much for putting this together. You know, um, Olden, my brother, I, 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 I feel your spirit. I know where you're at, man. I know where you're at. You ain't in the paint no more, but you're still blocking shots and, and they're doing your I thing. Know. I appreciate it's you, right. man. I appreciate it. They lay me in the ground. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> and each and, each and every one of you are a story onto yourself that would take a couple of hours. And, 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 yes. and Chris Bunn, man, very articulate brother, man. That's right. back, but he's, he's All you guys, I am so impressed by every last gentleman that was here. Thank you, guys. Mm. Thank, Thank you, man. It was great. You guys are going to get a copy of this. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure you get a copy of this in a few days. We're going to put it out so that we can all promote it. And it has to be done and put out in the current time so that people can absorb what's going on now. And that's what this is about. So Brother Boogie, one you, more man. thing. Brother Boogie, I, I just want to say to you, I know you're from New York. I'm from Jersey. Yeah. But yeah, we got to do something about the Knicks. You saw that statement they put out. Yeah. What, no, what is that? Well, they basically was like, well, we have no control over it. I'm, we're sorry. We're not. We, the employees were like, what are you going to say about it? So them and the wow. Spurs are the only two NBA teams that haven't said anything about it. So the wow. Knicks, all we can do is just pray. That's all we can do. Weak. Mm. Weak. Man. Oh, it can forever, but uh, that's unexcusable. Yes. So you guys are going to get a copy of this, like I said, and we'll uh, – but make sure you uh, get in touch with you sometime tomorrow. I'll let you know when it's going to it's between tomorrow and, and the next day. You'll have a copy of this for yourself. But I think it's important that you spend it with your people. And I'm so glad, man. I'm so blessed to be in my right state of mind and the activity of my limbs, man, to be able to sit here with you tonight and be in, and be in peace and harmony with my brothers, man. And I can go now show other brothers that our brothers can come together and we can talk intelligently, man. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. All of you. All of you. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.